Our next session will focus on exercise, specifically for individuals living with DMD and BMD. There will be 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. Our speaker today is Dr. Molly Spark Stark. Excuse me. <laughs> Molly Stark is a physical therapist and clinical evaluator at the Paul and Sheila Wellstone Muscular Dystrophy Center at the University of Minnesota. Um, she received her Bachelor of Science and Doctor of Physical Therapy degrees from the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse, and she has been a physical therapist for over 10 years, and she has nearly eight years of experience working with children and adults with neuromuscular disease. Molly is also a clinical evaluator and is involved in multiple clinical trials and research studies for individuals with neuromuscular diseases. So welcome, Dr. Stark, and we will now turn the time over to you. All right, hi everyone, thanks for being here. I'm excited to talk to you today about exercise um, with Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy. All right, so for my disclosures, I am a speaker for the Biogen Speakers Bureau um, and I'm also a clinical evaluator for the following companies um, doing clinical trials. None of that should relate to what I'm gonna talk to you today about though. All right, so before we talk about exercise and what you can do in terms of moving forward, we gotta back way up and talk about some anatomy and physiology. So you kinda understand what's going on and why exercise is a hot topic when you have Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy. So this is kind of the basic skeletal muscle structure. Um, you can see that big muscle attaches to the bone, which kinda anchors it, so it gives it something to pull on um, to generate force. And how a muscle does that is it's a very contractile tissue um, with lots of different parts that help it contract. Um, so there's kind of the big bundle, that's the muscle, and then it breaks down into smaller muscle fibers. Um, where Duchenne and Becker are affected are way down on that myofibril. Inside of there are some proteins that um, are not allowing it to function properly. So if we go deeper into the muscle cell as we dive in, um, you can see those that thin and thick filament on the end of the myofibril that's sticking out. Those two need to slide across each other in order for the muscle to contract. Um, in order to do that, they need a lot of proteins to help them pull across each other and let go so that you can move your muscles up and down. And then if we dive in further, um, let me back up. So we're gonna look at um, that thin and thick filament and between those, for them to communicate and work together, um, the distoglycan complex, all those proteins need to function properly. Um, so that complex links that thin filament to the matrix so it gives it something to anchor on. Kind of like the muscle anchored on the bone, um, this filament needs to anchor onto something and it does so with the help of dystrophin. This is a super complex picture. Basically to show dystrophin there is that like light blue anchor. Um, that's attached to the thin filament and it's its anchor to help it pull and move across and slide so that the muscle can contract. If that dystrophin is not functioning properly, it can't anchor properly so the muscle can't contract properly um, and then you can't move your muscles. Um, the similar things happens in Becker and Duchenne. Um, obviously for Duchenne, more dystrophin is affected um, so the muscles are more severely affected. So why is all that important? How do these muscles really contract? Um, you can see that's like a super simplified di diagram of that thin and thick filament in that muscle that we had talked about. Um, when they are relaxed, they're a little bit more spread apart. And in order for them to contract, the dystrophin has to help stabilize it. And those fibers kind of move across each other. The muscle shortens, and so you can do something. So let's take, for an example, you want to eat an apple and bring it up to your face to eat. Um, in order to do that, your bicep has to get shorter, it has to contract, and so it brings the apple up to your face. So that's a concentric contraction where the muscle is shortening as it's working. Um, then, say you're done taking your bite, you wanna put it back down onto the table. In order to do that, the force of the apple has to outweigh the force of your muscle, and so the muscle goes, all right, well I don't want it to flop down on the table, I want it to go slowly, and so those fibers are slowly letting go of each other to let you release that apple back down to the table in an in a easy manner. Um, let's say you just wanna offer that, oh sorry, so that's an eccentric contraction, and that's kind of a, big word because I'm sure you've heard in clinic, you come in and say, okay, well, you can do some exercise, but no eccentric contractions. When the muscle's lengthening as it's working like that, 
it's the hardest on it. And so those little proteins, everything is working so hard to slowly let it go. And it's a lot of pressure on them and can damage the proteins involved if they aren't functioning properly. Um, all right, so then that last one is an isometric contraction. Basically, let's say you want to hand your apple off to somebody. So you want to hold it out and hold it in this position until they come to grab it. Um, so the force of your muscle has to balance the force of that apple pulling down on your arm. Um, so all those fibers are basically gotten to their position and they're trying to stay there in that one spot. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll talk a little bit about pathology and what happens in somebody with um, Duchenne or Becker who's exercising or overworking their muscles. Um, so let's say that apple became a bowling ball and they're repeatedly doing that motion again and again but with a much heavier object. Um, so that eccentric contraction, say the bowling ball is here, somebody hands it to the person with Duchenne or Becker and they're letting it come back. You don't want it to drop because it can drop very quickly. You want to slowly bring it back in order to roll it forward. So you're having an eccentric contraction through the muscle as it's slowly coming down. Um, and when you have that contraction and all the proteins are working so hard to hold on but they're just not doing it as properly, the muscle is getting some little tears in it which result in inflammation coming in. Your body's saying, hey, something's going on here. Muscles are working really hard. We need to come in and help which results in inflammation. Inflammation um, can cause some degeneration um, because of all the, the little factors that the inflammation brings in. In typical muscle tissue, um, that degenerated tissue is replaced and regenerated. The muscle comes back stronger, healthier, ready to go bowling again. Um, but for somebody with Duchenne or Becker, that muscle tissue is replaced with fibrotic tissue. And fibrotic tissue is not contractile. All those little fibers don't slide back and forth across each other. Um, so the muscle becomes weaker because of that tissue that's been replaced that's not muscle tissue. Um, and that kind of starts the cycle again because then they're working a weaker muscle, getting more inflammation, and it's kind of a vicious cycle. All right, any questions on that, the basic components before we keep going? Okay. Um, so we might talk about all that and go, well, yeah, somebody with Duchenne or Becker shouldn't exercise. But that's not actually the case because there's a lot of other factors going on um, that can influence muscle. Another thing we got to talk about is disuse, disuse atrophy. If muscles aren't used, the body basically goes, why should I maintain a muscle if it's not being used? And so it starts to atrophy over time, becomes weaker, and then we get that whole faulty cycle happening again and again. Um, so I'm here to say that exercise is good in some capacities by some types. Um, we just have to have kind of some guidelines established around them. Um, one other thing that I really want to highlight before we jump into exercise itself is that um, car cardiopulmonary considerations are important too. The heart is a muscle and it relies on dystrophin too. So if it's working extra hard, it can also be damaged in the same way, similar way as the skeletal muscles that we talked about. Um, so strenuous exercise can, can trigger an acute heart or lung problem. You should always see a cardiologist and a pulmonologist before starting any kind of exercise program. All right, so then we're gonna dive into a little bit of literature about exercise um, and where I'm gonna get some of these guidelines from. So this is a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is basically one giant study of all the studies, and it chooses a particular topic. So in this case, they chose exercise and Duchenne. I'm gonna talk about Becker too, but this study is particularly for Duchenne. Um, so they, systematically combine all the data from lots of different studies to give us one set of results. Um, they basically said there's not good consistent guidelines for exercise. Um, the general recommendation is submaximal exercise. So that's what they kind of used in their search was Duchenne and submaximal exercise. They screened 2,300 studies 
Um, of those, 25 were good full text articles, um, but then they removed some of those because of their data was not good. Um, the design wasn't really proper. So they came up with 12 studies that they said, yes, these are good studies about exercise in Duchenne. Let's look at these and summarize them. Um, of those, there was um, 282 subjects in all of those studies. The average age was about 10 or 11 years old. Um, a third were ambulatory, a third were non-ambulatory, and then um, another third was unknown. And they looked at basically two types of exercise, limb exercise and respiratory muscle training. Um, and then there was short-term and longer-term durations. Um, the big limitations of it were that as the severity of disease progresses, recommendations change because the muscles are changing. Um, this is really summarized for those particular subjects in it. There were, on average, about 10 or 11. Um, and they also said that exercise training um, is really influenced by the different phenotypes of Duchenne, meaning some people with Duchenne are much more severely affected and some people are less severely affected. So it all varies. It's why you got to see a neurologist or a physical therapist before you start an exercise program. So let's talk about what, what they found and what studies are out there. First, uh, these are the respiratory exercise studies. Um, I put a bunch on here. You don't have to take all this in. Basically, it's showing that um, there's lots of different ways to do respiratory exercise. A lot of it is inspiratory, like taking a deep breath in, in different ways, or expiratory, like expelling your air in different ways. Um, they have different trainings with devices um, that people worked on, and it really varied in frequency from two days, two times a day, all the way up to daily, um, and there was different intensities with it too. So this is why it's a little hard to come up with guidelines because the studies are really variable um, and the patients were really variable in them. And then we'll talk about limb exercise and what studies were done on that prior to 2021. Um, for this, there were some cycling ones. There was a video game assist one, um, leg and arm cycling, I should say. There were some stretching ones, stretching with manual resistance and um, some resistance training. Um, and it really varied to anywhere from three times a week up to seven times a week. Um, their general conclusion was that the regular submaximal exercise might maintain strength and might prevent disuse atrophy. Um, so in a meta-analysis, they try to summarize all of that data into really simple graphs that we can kind of go, is it good or not? Is exercise good or not? Um, so each of those skinny black lines is a different study that was inside of this study, and that triangle is them summarized. Um, if it's further to the right, it's saying that it favors training. That study found that training is good, exercise training is good. If it's to the left, it favored not doing anything or the control group. So you can see most of them fell on the favors training side. Um, muscular strength was improved by interventions. There was really no difference in placebo groups doing exercise that wasn't what it was properly supposed to do. Um, but there was a really big effect size for exercise versus no exercise, meaning exercise is good in some capacity um, versus not doing anything at all. And then they did the same thing for endurance of your muscles, like how long they can last doing the tasks that you're asking them to do. Um, endurance was improved by the exercise training interventions, and there was significant differences in the exercise versus placebo and versus none. So they found a little bit better benefits for the endurance tests than the strength tests. And then they reported some other things that can be helpful. Um, out of all those interventions, doing the different strengthening, they didn't find any effects on their functional tests. So perhaps if you go into clinic or work with a therapist, they might have had you do functional tests like getting off the floor, climbing stairs, walking, transferring, um, and they really didn't find effects on those functional tests um, with the patients doing exercise. Um, they also didn't find effects on their lung function, so those breathing tests that you might do in clinic really didn't change in the studies. Um, they found 
some improvement in quality of life, although it was not significant. Um, but overall, there was no adverse events. The studies, some of them monitored adverse events really well. They looked at their CK, at their pain, fatigue, and some of them just kind of provided supervision, said, you're doing okay, everything's good, nothing bad happened throughout the course of the study. Um, all those were summarized prior to 2021 in that analysis. There's still studies going on. There's a lot of exercise studies happening. I couldn't put them all in here. I just basically tried to pull the ones that have a really good setup for their study so we can draw pretty good conclusions from it. Um, so in 2022, there was a study that said yoga and physical therapy is just as effective as PT by itself, meaning yoga doesn't do anything harmful um, and could be good. Um, there was also a study on martial arts that said that is safe and feasible if it's something you're able to do. Um, and then aerobic tra training via cycling, which is an ergometer, um, may improve motor function, and they didn't find any negative effects in the muscle. I think that for that one, they tested their CK and didn't find any changes when they did a cycling program. Um, <clears throat> all of this, too, is clinical studies on people. I am not even diving into the mouse studies. There's a lot out there. That's how we develop a lot of the protocols that we're doing in people because we've tested them on mice and kind of seen how they respond to exercise. There's lots of creative ways that they have mice exercise so we kind of know how they're doing. Um, and a lot of those show good results from doing some activity um, and a few of them show not as good results. So it kind of is similar to human studies that it really varies. Okay, that was a lot of data, <laughs> a lot of studies about Duchenne. Any questions so far on any of the studies or what they were finding or what we're looking at? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was about physical therapy. Um, and this person's husband went to a physical therapist who didn't know much about Becker after you broke your leg. and were, femur. Your femur. Okay. And trying to get back at it and wondered about guidelines, if there are some guidelines out there. Um, there are some there are some guidelines, yes. There's the rehab guidelines um, that talk about it um, that were published in 2018, I think. They give a very generic guideline kind of on exercise. Um, some of it is what we'll talk about in here. Um, it's definitely something that a therapist should be looking up if they have someone all of a sudden on their schedule who has Becker or Duchenne and they're not familiar with it. Um, so I definitely bring it to the attention of your therapist that there's published guidelines out there. Yep. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, so then we're gonna talk about Becker-specific studies. Um, for them, there's a little bit less, but there's some, still some really good um, research out there that's happened in the last 20 years or so. Um, there's been a variety of studies that look at cycling, um, arm and leg strengthening, high-intensity aerobic exercise, strength and aerobic training, and then this anti-gravity anti treadmill training. Um, all of them are really different. Their intensity was really different. Some of them had much easier intensities and some were really intense. Um, so for this top one, they found, they did a cycling test um, and they found that the muscle itself didn't change because they did a biopsy and looked at that and they found that the CK didn't change when they were doing this 65% of max, which is basically 100% of your VO2 max is pushing yourself like to the limit, to the point you're exhausted and can collapse from exercise. 65% um, is kind of submaximal where you get really tired doing it, but it's not exhausting. Um, so in it, they found that the CK didn't change and the muscle biopsy looked really good afterwards, looked similar to when they started. Um, they didn't find any change in their cardiac function. Um, and the strength of the muscles that they used in cycling increased by about 15 to 40%. So some of them got much stronger while they were doing the program. Um, for the next one down, the arm and leg strengthening, they found that it was well tolerated. So maybe um, people should be considering supervised resistance training. Um, for the high intensity aerobic exercise, I think that one was on a treadmill. Um, and they were going up to like that really high max intensity training, they found that people still had an elevated CK 24 hours after exercise. So they were finding that probably that really high intensity was too much for somebody with Becker. 
Um, the strength and aerobic one, they were kind of looking at functional body strengthening. They were looking at squats, calf raises, lunges. Um, and they found that everybody in the study was able to increase the number that they were doing from the beginning to the end of it. And um, for the anti-gravity treadmill, so this treadmill is basically like a balloon that somebody goes in and it fills up with air and it can take away some or all of gravity. So you can choose like take away half my body weight so you're just not feeling as intensely. It's kind of like doing exercise on the moon. It's just taking away a lot of your gravity um, in your lower half. And so for this one, it was people with Becker who were severely affected. Um, they got in this treadmill and they were able to increase their walking distance by the end of the study and their balance, like their trunk and core control when they were standing and sitting um, from doing it. Um, so these are all encouraging. They're all telling me that exercise is good. We just have to figure out how it should be done and in a safe way. Um, and that there's tons of really good research going on out there. Um, just really varies. I know there's a question back here. I'm going to let him grab the microphone so that you can um, do it so everybody can hear and, and people online can hear. So my question is around the high intensity aerobic exercise and uh, somebody with Becker's and I have myotonic dystrophy not Becker's and I can no way get to high intensity on aerobic exercises. So uh, is that uh, O2 max? Is that VO2? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, in your experience, somebody, I don't know, relative to what I, I have, can they actually get to a high intensity? Yeah. So, for that study, they chose individuals that had a very high level of function. So, there are people with Becker that are able to run and sprint and do really high intensity exercise. Um, and so, those were the ones selected for those high intensity ones. Yeah. Good Thank clarification. You. Thank you. Mm hmm. Okay, we're going to get out of the weeds of all this research and talk about implicating it and how, um, how it could work for you on a day-to-day -day or weekly program. Um, big things to consider, I can already mention this, but definitely talk to your neurologist and physical therapist before you start any kind of exercise program. Everybody's so different. Um, it, it's good to just kind of make sure it's, it's specific to you and how your body is doing. Um, in general, always got to start slow and kind of gradually increase the intensity so your body can adapt to how it's going and then focus on you and what you like. There's so many different kinds of activity and exercise and if you're putting your energy into it and your time into it, you got to make sure it's something that you really like. So when I'm working with somebody, yeah, Kelly. Molly, were those cats really in a workout class? Or yeah, those cats are really in a workout class. Don't they look good? <laughs> I lead cat yoga on the weekends, yeah. <laughs> um, so if I'm working with somebody and we're talking about goals that they want to do, usually it's nice when you're starting an exercise program to have a purpose um, because it helps with motivation and helps give you something to work towards um, and do. So biggest things is to optimize function, meaning is this going to help with your transfers or rolling in bed or walking a little bit further or doing the stairs at home? Um, like I said, everybody's different, but there's got to be some functional thing to focus on. And then minimizing impairment, meaning impairments are kind of what happens to your body um, when it's affected by a neuromuscular disease. So is it a loss of motion? Is it a strength deficit? Is it that your balance is really off? Is it that you have a lot of pain in your joints? Um, so we want to minimize all of those different things that are important to you. Um, and then improve your tolerance to different positions. So is your goal to sit upright more? Is it to stand for longer so you can wash the dishes or cook your favorite meal? Um, reducing the secondary effects of the disease. So I have a lot of people that are in a chair a lot of the time, leaning over to drive their joystick and can develop scoliosis over time. So when we're doing exercise, thinking about, all right, how can we get them away from that leaning over towards the joystick and correct their posture that way? Um, and then to avoid fatigue and overuse syndromes um, by doing exercise, because it can, you know, fatigue is a really important thing that affects people with Duchenne and Becker, um, and sometimes exercise can help combat that. So what do you get out of doing exercise? Um, maybe we can increase, maintain, or at least minimize that progressive decline by moving. 
Um, maybe improve functional capacity, like the transfers or walking or stairs. Um, improve your body's regulatory response system, like your nervous system and your endocrine system, which kind of make you feel better overall. Um, there's a lot of hormones and endorphins that are released as you exercise, and that can really improve mental health and how you generally are doing. Um, and then it may affect, may decrease the effects of the disease pro process. So then we start to think about exercise. All right, you've decided, yep, Molly's right, I should do some kind of exercise. Um, what does that look like? How do I, I don't, how do you know where to start? Um, so you can prescribe exercises, kind of like you prescribe a medication. Um, first, we got to think about frequency. Would it be once a week? Is it every day? Is it somewhere in between there? Um, how intense do I want it? Is it something that's fairly easy that I don't, my heart rate or my respiratory rate does increase, or do I want something that pushes it a little bit more? Um, how long are you going to do it? Should it start with one or two minutes of doing the exercise and work up? Do I want to jump in at 10 minutes? You know, the time can really vary. Um, and then we're going to talk about lots of different types of exercise that could be potential. So stretching is one kind of exercise. Um, to maintain joint mobility, prevent contractures, um, increase blood flow. There's lots of good benefits that you can get from stretching and lots of different ways. Um, <clears throat> a lot of it, um, you know, I work at a peds clinic, so I do a lot of education with caregivers and how they can help with stretching. But then those kids grow up and need to take over their stretching program. Um, so then there's ways for them to do them on their own. Um, there's two big kinds of stretching, either long duration where you're wearing a splint or a brace or something overnight where it's holding your body, your joint in that certain position for a long time, or quick ones where somebody helps with it and then the stretch is over. The long duration ones are really good for maintaining a joint motion, um, but the short ones are also important too. This is something that I really encourage everybody to do at least once a day um, to maintain the motion in their joints. And then standing is also really good, something that everybody, if they're able, should do once a day in some capacity. Um, whether it's in a stander or a standing wheelchair or at a counter or with some support, there's lots of different ways to assist with standing. It's really great because it helps with stretching. Um, it promotes bone health, enables their upright participation, maybe in the classroom they're standing, um, supports trunk posture and GI motility. Or there's balance. So we talked a little bit about martial arts. There's lots of different ways to incorporate, incorporate balance. Um, doing a home program that's assigned by a physical therapist um, to do specific tasks that would be really good for you. Um, martial <laughs> arts, yoga, or doing like the Wii video game balance systems. Balance can be done both in sitting and in standing. So there's a component to balance of sitting upright and also standing and moving. Strengthening. Um, so there's lots of different ways to do strengthening programs. Like I talked about in the beginning, there's those different ways you can strengthen your muscle or move it, doing the concentric, eccentric, or isometric strengthening. Um, with that, we tend to recommend away from doing eccentric because it's so hard on the muscles. So an example of that would be like walking down stairs repeatedly or running down hills or jumping on a trampoline. Those are all things that really stress the muscles in eccentric ways that aren't, aren't good. Um, but then doing like an isometric program where you're squeezing different muscle groups and concentrating on holding that squeeze for a certain amount of seconds and then relaxing really helps um, work those muscles. Um, it is appropriate to do minimal up to moderate resistance in a supervised way with a physical therapist um, or doing body weight exercises if that's something that your body is capable of doing. Um, this one has a lesser frequency than a lot of them we talked about because your body needs time to recover after doing some kind of more intense exercise. Um, aerobic exercise is also really good. You can get in a lot of different forms, like whether it's swimming, doing those video game activities, um, cycling, yoga, wheelchair sports, anything that gets your respiratory and cardiac um, rates up um, is classified as like a re rest, an aerobic exercise. Um, I mentioned aquatic therapy on the last one, but it is awesome because it takes away gravity, kind of like that treadmill. It just allows your body to float. You can move more freely. Um, it provides resistance to your muscles as you're moving through the water, but it also takes away the effects of gravity, and so you can do a lot more. 
um, and it takes the pressure off your joints and it's not quite as strenuous on the muscles. And then there's respiratory muscle training. So we talked a lot about those studies that looked at respiratory muscle training. There's lots of ways to do this. I'm barely going to touch on it because I think this is, um, you know, there's two ways to talk about respiratory muscle training. One is from a pulmonology standpoint and pulmonary health, and one is from all those muscles that surround your lungs. Um, you use muscles to breathe in and out, and those can be affected by Duchenne and Becker. Um, they help you expand your lungs and help you contract them. So there's lots of different respiratory exer exercises that you could do. I have some listed up here. If you have specific questions, I can go through them. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll just keep going. And then um, there were some recommendations published. They're not officially guidelines, but some recommendations for Becker-specific exercise that were published in 2016. Um, they basically say that exercise up to three to four times a week um, and mild to moderate intensity um, for up to 30 minutes is good. They do still recommend avoiding eccentric exercise and really fatiguing the muscles. So if you get done with an exercise program and you're exhausted and can't do much for the rest of the day, we know it was too much. Or if your muscles are really sore the next day, also definitely too much. One time of doing that, you're not impacting yourself for the rest of your life. It's just a good reminder that that's too much um, and your body's just giving you that reminder. Um, one thing that I thought was really good in these recommendations is that they said there's kind of a stigma against Duchenne and Becker and doing exercise. They kind of say, don't do anything, preserve your muscles. Um, but we have to rethink it a little bit because some exercise is good and moving your body is good in whatever capacity you're able to do um, because we're also battling that disuse atrophy. They're kind of pushing against each other. Um, so what we should really focus on is your response to exercise, not the damage itself, but how you do after it. So in general, um, balance activity with rest, avoid fatigue and muscle soreness afterwards, stay really hydrated so your muscles are at their peak function. Um, remember that movement and participation are not just for your physical health, but also your social and emotional health. Um, and choose the right activities for you. So think about what do you like to do? Do you like to work with horses? Um, do you like to swim? Do you want to play power soccer? There's lots of good opportunities around the metro. Um, definitely talk to your physical therapist um, and see what ideas they have and can develop more of a specific program for you.